come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie talk show and podcast or a review podcast that comes your way every talk Saturday night. <laughs> Are you ready for it or not? Are you ready for it? No, clearly not. Are you ready to bring justice to the streets of New York, Colin? Well, I mean, we we already did. I think like this is the the, the listener has to catch up with us because we already did this. Uh, um, but anyway, anything you can do to help us, like uh, you know. Get through those algorithms and become the fastest growing internet radio podcast in the world is uh, all you got to do is go on over to wherever you find us and hit that like or subscribe button or uh, was a little bell on YouTube, right? The I think subscription so. Subscription bell. Uh, I ignore YouTube. And that, <laughs> that's not what happens. Um, anyway, who are these people who are talking to you? They're the internet radio superstars. Michaela. Holly. And I'm Colin. Sean is on assignment tonight. Mm -hmm. So he missed out on tonight's movie. Which was chosen by Colin. What did we watch tonight? Tonight we watched the on-brand Canon movie. I was going to say masterpiece. That might be going. We're, we're jumping the shark. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean <laughs> double your load, Colin. I, <laughs> That's right. I would say most Canon movies are a masterpiece in like their own Canon in way. Some way, you know, yeah. in their own Canon way. Yeah, yeah. they have like a Canon masterpiece is different. They have exactly. personality, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. They have. Personality. They do. Okay, we got to get into. It. Well, anyway, yeah. so where the movie we're talking about is Death Wish Three from and, the year, and this is from uh, 1985. 85, directed by uh, Michael Winner. Who do we know Michael Winner from? Death Wish 1 and 2. There it is. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think he also did a Hercule Poirot movie, uh, okay. like Death on the Nile or something. He did a um, Philip Marlowe movie, um, uh, Farewell, My Lovely. No, no, sorry. He did The Big Sleep, the remake oh, okay. of The Big Sleep okay. with uh, Robert Mitchum. So he'd been around for a while. I think he actually he did uh, Mr. Majestic. If I'm correct, the Charles Bronson movie. So Charles Bronson's in this movie, and this was, I think, the fourth time that they had worked together. Wow. That's right. a lot. Yeah. So Canon Films is a, a studio that we've talked about a lot on the Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, they keep coming up. Uh, why? Canon's, why? What? What's the appeal? Canon, of Canon is a films? comfort place for us. <laughs> yeah, I, I. It'll be a sad day when we run out of Canon stuff. I mean, there, that day is a long ways off. But, yeah. <laughs> but it'll be a sad day. I mean, Canon uh, was famous for Golan and Globus cousins, I believe, if I remember yeah. correctly. Um, make it as quick and cheap as you possibly can rip off some movie trend that's happening or pop culture phenomenon quick and, and cheap just how yeah well they didn't they didn't do it cheap they yeah. they threw money at, at things i don't know that's where it's like where did the money come from i mean obviously they eventually had some <clears throat> successes because i mean by the time they bankrupted the company with like Superman four, the quest for peace oof, oof. or masters Yikes. of the universe yeah. yes. <laughs> like that. movies that tanked at the box yeah. office, but they spent a fortune on them. And when they invested in Toby Hooper, right. For oh, the uh, yeah. double header of life force and invaders from Mars, yeah. those movies were not uh, mm -hmm. inexpensive. And they were known for turning out several movies in a year, like sometimes up to 10 movies in one year like yeah. it was a crazy release schedule i want to say on our break in or break into episode we talked about i think those movies were like eight or nine months apart in release or something like that yeah. it was yeah. something insane like that i feel like a good metaphor would be as if parents gave their kids their credit card to open a lemonade stand yeah, yeah. that's canon that yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah i don't think blumhouse would exist if canon yeah canon walked so blumhouse could run yeah you know well, there's two, and Michaela, I'm sure you've watched them both, documentaries mm -hmm. I have on, watched them both. okay, what are they called? Just for <laughs> uh, the Electric on. Boogaloo is one, mm -hmm. and I don't remember what the other one's called. Yeah, you're right. I, know it's <laughs> I, don't remember. I, I think I watched them both, too. one they, of them they, is by Golan and Globus, right? Yeah. And that's the less honest one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and Electric Boogaloo is like just a, a good, if you want to get a good list going of movies you want to watch, watch Electric Boogaloo, because they'll show a bunch of clips and you'll be like, oh, got to see that. Now I got to yeah. see that. Because I didn't know it like all started with The Apple, which was directed by Menachem Golan. Stay, <laughs> stay tuned for The Apple when we eventually <laughs> cover that in the Freak Show. We will have to at yeah, some point. Yeah, it looks nuts. It's a musical or whatever it's but. it is but it has like no discernible plot oh it, yeah it, like even like i know most musicals don't really have a plot but this is next level <laughs> yeah well canon like existed before the uh golan and globus but they purchased i guess a hollywood movie studio then i think the studios kind of 
disliked Canon because they were competing and you know, and scoring well with these like extremely we'll call them lowbrow movies, right? Uh, but that resonated with audiences, right? And somewhere in the 1980s, they made uh, two big investments. Well, they made a, a third investment later uh, in in talent. Mm-hmm. Well, I suppose actually, then Jean Claude Van Damme would be the fourth one. Yeah. But anyway, I was going to say that they started off with uh, the 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 double header of Charles Bronson and Chuck Norris. They used to say they had the two piles for Chucks, one for Chuck Bronson, <laughs> one for Chuck Norris, and they would sort the scripts by which Chuck is going to get this one. Yeah. <laughs> so you read it. Which yep. one does it go? Yeah, because yep. we talked about that on our American Ninja. Yep. That was supposed to be a Chuck Norris movie. Like, so basically martial arts goes to Norris yep. and, yeah. cop, and cop goes to yep. Bronson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then gotcha. there was uh, they briefly made a huge investment as part of a huge investment in Michaela's favorite actor of all time, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, I know who it is <laughs> <laughs> for Cobra and uh, Over, Over the, the top. top. Yeah, God bless that movie. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> So, Kyle um, and I still think we need a rematch. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can hear our arm wrestling episode. Where, uh, yeah, didn't we all like? We uh, did all yeah. arm wrestle. Yeah. I wore a trucker hat and that's right. <laughs> turned it around when it was time to flip the switch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, that was fun. You know, I I need I need Stallone to get back with Canon like nowadays to yeah. like complete his trilogy and do another movie with them. I don't care what it is, yeah. but it'd be. Could you imagine if we saw the headline tomorrow, like? Stallone back with Golden Globus, like to make oh. another canon film. Yeah. I, I don't care what it is. Let me see it. Well, at least one of them, unfortunately, I believe, has mm. passed away. I, think so, yeah. I don't know if they both have. And I know that there was a split between them um, somewhere around the time the company dissolved. And then Menachem Golan went off and formed 21st Century Films, which brought us such movies as Captain America, also done on our show, <laughs> Phantom of the Opera with uh, Robert Englund and several other mm-hmm. <laughs> movies from the, the, the 90s. <laughs> um, so Charles Bronson, right? Um, has He's an actor who it feels to me has about like three phases to his career, right? Mm-hmm. There's the, you know, like young Charles Bronson, mm-hmm. upcoming Hollywood star uh, right. that you would remember from movies such as... Oh, um... I was about to say Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and that's not it. <laughs> it's the other one. It's <laughs> yeah. Well, Once Upon a Time in uh, America. He was, um, or no, not America. In sorry. the West. In, in the, the West. West. Yes. Uh, both by Sergio Leone, right. so you could interchange those titles. Uh, but yeah, The Magnificent Seven yeah. he was in, uh, The Dirty Dozen, you know. And um, so there's Western Bronson. There's Western at the, at and the start yeah. and like, you know, military, you know, whatever. Sure. But uh, he became tough guy Bronson in mm-hmm. the 70s when you had movies, which I think maybe were all inspired by uh, his success with uh, Death Wish. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was Mr. Majestic and the Stone Killer and, you know, I mean, just tons of the White Buffalo. I mean, like tons of stuff. Break Heart Pass, like tons and tons of previous movies. episode. Ten to Midnight. I was going to say Ten to Midnight. Well, ten to Midnight. <laughs> would be the third phase that Here comes from okay. the canon era because gotcha. that okay. movie doesn't have the logo on the front of it but it was it, a, it was a canon film. it has all the dna of a canon <laughs> really film does. that's for sure yeah 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 that yeah you got to go back and listen to that episode because i believe that was a freak show uh oh, oh, absolutely. Freak I, show I think about that movie all the time <laughs> yeah. i think about i think about charles Bronson saying the knife's his penis all the time. Like, all the time. Well, help me then explain to the uh, listener at home the appeal of Charles Bronson. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what it is. No, I, I don't know what it is either. I don't. I, I, the turtlenecks and the sweaters and the leather jackets. I, I don't know. So he seems very normal and approachable. Like he, maybe that's yeah. What it is. Like he looks like he kind of looks like my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he looks like he could be my Co- grandpa. And coincidentally, I think that's what my works. dad really likes him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's just very um. He's chill, but you know he'll take care of business, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, Okay, yeah. okay, so that's like, the persona yeah. that's coming like across. Like, if he was in this room, I would feel comfortable, yeah. like comforted, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. everything's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, okay, well, because yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, like, that kind of career and the idea that he became, like, you know, a tough guy persona when you watch him i'm like i don't know if i do do you see him as a tough guy but like all his movies are basically you know here's the thing if i were to just see him would i think he's a tough guy no but knowing his like personas in his movies 
it works. I don't know. I like that he's an undercover tough guy. Yeah. Because the street toughs in the movies always underestimate him. Yes. And then he gets the upper hand. And that's like, as a viewer, it's fun to watch. Yeah. I you agree. know, like, I agree. like, it always kind of stretches credibility when it's like, well, why would they even fuck with that? Like someone like Arnold or Stallone? Because right. it's like they could just right. like crush them with one hand, you know? Yes. But it's like, this looks like your grandpa. He walks to the convenience store to get ice cream, Colin. <laughs> He literally does that in this movie. Like, yeah, that's so relatable, you know? God, I love that scene. Well, that's also <laughs> part of like the the odd part of the, the canon era appeal. And this is why I think last week we were talking about, you know, I made the comparison that Liam Neeson is today's Charles Bronson, where it's like, this guy could be your grandfather, yeah, basically, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. but it, now he's like an action star or yeah. you know, he's the tough guy. And so, of course, then you have to kind of age up the cast also. So it's like these movies are kind of shooting for a certain age demographic. He was like 63 when he made uh, Death Wish 3. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, OK, again, 63 like my dad. guy. <laughs> go around. Yeah. But I feel like he's looked the same for like 30 years. Oh, yeah, yeah. there is that. Like, yeah. I feel like he's looked that age for a long time. Yes. Yeah. 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 He has uh, a magnificent head of hair. He does. He really does. He's, it seems yeah. like his actual hair. Right. I, oh, I, I mean, is, we've yeah. seen some bad hair helmets on this show in the past. And yeah. This is a, this is definitely real hair. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your familiarity with uh, the Death Wish movie series? This is my first. I've seen the original and that's it. What, what was your assessment of the original? That's fine. I, I mean, now that you've seen it's this one, good. I guess you can compare and contrast. Yeah. But like. I mean, I felt like there was a lot built up around that movie when I watched it because you hear about how iconic it is. And then you also hear about how I don't know if you guys, you guys haven't seen that remake with Bruce Willis. Have I you? did. Yeah. I heard it was dreadful. Like I heard it was just ACDC wall on the wall, just like that fucking trailer. And I was like, I'm out. But um, it was fine. The original it was fine. Perfectly yeah. watchable the, movie. The original, it, to me, was like, this is a, a legitimate movie. Right, right. You right. know, like, Death Wish 3 is not, right? This is an yeah. exploitation film. Oh, <laughs> but, like, so if so Canon's bad. doing this type of movie, this is their direction I want them to take it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But, like, Canon, much like Blumhouse, like, every once in a while they had one, like, legitimate movie that would get, like, you know, a lot of attention. Like, did, like... Canon eventually did Barfly, that movie with Mickey Rourke that I think really? got not yeah oh, wow. that I think got nominated for like Academy Awards yeah. and wow, just like friends. Blumhouse had Whiplash yeah. that eventually you know won Academy Awards yeah. like every mm -hmm. once in a while they hit it just right yeah yeah well Death Wish was actually that was a Paramount movie uh, produced by Dino De Laurentiis um, <laughs> Canon so that was nineteen like seventy I can't remember it was seventy seventy two seventy four. And oh, so this is way after yeah, that. Yeah, Canon bought the right. So when when Golan Globus took over the company, they zeroed in on like that particular property as mm -hmm. like we're going to buy the Death Wish franchise and make more of these. Like so, Bronson's career was already kind of on the outs, and that's when Canon steps in and like resurrected him and like we, we love Charles Bronson. What are you talking about? Like we got to bring this guy back. Like I see this move playing out and it makes total sense to me. Yeah, I mean <laughs> right. Yeah, Death Wish Two, um, which brought back the original film's director, became I think the first profitable or like big hit uh, Canon uh, mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. So that was the one that like started their you know uh, run. Um, the first one, well, like I said, it's a legitimate uh, movie that, you know, has like some social concerns to it. The second one is, um, I don't know, that's a sleazy movie. I mean, like, that's troublesome when you watch is it that, now. Yeah, it's like, it's just skeevy. You know, probably and not my cup of tea. No, probably not. <laughs> um, and the whole idea of the character, the character's name is Paul Kersey, uh -huh. right? Uh, these are based on a novel. Uh, by a guy, I think his name is Brian Garfield, mm -hmm. who apparently disowned the movies because he's like, you know, they went a completely different way than how I saw this. I feel character. like a lot of authors do it when yeah. they don't get the amount of involvement they want in a movie. Whether yeah. or not that's true, I feel like they come out and say that, I you know. I think it changed his perspective on who the character was because the the idea, if you're not familiar with, with Death Wish, the idea is that there's this guy... Um, He's an architect. He's kind of, uh, you know, like upper middle class or at least middle class guy. Um, he was in the Korean War, but he was a conscientious objector. 
and one day his uh, wife is murdered and his daughter raped by these guys who break into the, you know, just random act of violence, right? And so he feels like, you know, like, what can we, I do about this? The police don't seem to be doing anything. And so he goes out and buys a gun and then ends up like somehow just wandering into muggers like on the street and then starts mm-hmm. shooting them all and becomes a, a vigilante. Uh, I got to set this up. Well, you probably already gathered it from watching this movie, but by the end of it, his the ripple effect of his actions in New York City um, actually caused a reduction in crime. And so the cops are like, OK, we want the criminals to think you're still out there, but you got to stop doing this. So what we're going to do is you're going to get the hell out of town <laughs> and we're going to sweep this under the rug. Right. So that's the original Death Wish. Death Wish 2, he goes to California. And of course, the same shit all happens all over again. So it could because his daughter is attacked again and killed. <laughs> so his entire immediate family is wiped out in the first two movies. So now we're stuck with, okay, we're going to do a sequel because the last one did a lot of a big box office of business. How do we bring this guy back and legitimize his, uh, you know, Death Wish? A war buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He moves into a, another troubled neighborhood and just can't quit quit his job i guess yeah i mean it really is like a tenuous like okay for the third movie yeah there's a friend hitherto on you know never mentioned before in the series who uh yeah like he was a, a korean warm buddy even mm-hmm. though like mm-hmm. they apparently politically disagreed but became friends mm-hmm. and so he knows something's up but where this guy lives and paul kersey goes to visit and the guy of course on the day that kersey arrives in new york is the day that that guy gets killed in his tenement building. Right. <laughs> He's basically like a punisher that just goes from town to town cl- cleaning up the bad neighborhoods. Like, yeah. yeah. So we're going we're gonna to say this, right? And like also the- like punisher that loses everyone he's ever cared about. Yeah. yeah. Well, the punisher does do. That's what I mean. Like, like yeah. the punisher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am not 100% sure about the origins of the comic book character, the Punisher, but I'm guessing he was inspired by had to have been uh, death. I would think so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which was actually um, so I was laid up here for a little bit a while ago. This is why I watch like all because I'm like I haven't seen you know mm-hmm. beyond the first Death Wish movie. I went and watched all five of them in a row. Wow! And th- yeah, I know. <laughs> and then, and then I was like, what is going on? Like you know, with the vigilante movie. And it turns out this is a subgenre, which actually did exist at one point, because then I saw a movie called Vigilante from the guy who did Maniac. Yeah. Oh, wow. With Robert Forster in it and Fred Williamson. And it's actually like more heightened even than this. Oh, wow. Is it really? Uh, but I would recommend that one. Or maybe <laughs> maybe I should have held on to that and showed up on a freak show in a, in a eh, future episode. Yeah. <laughs> There's two movies called uh, The Exterminator. You ever heard of these? I have heard of that. It's got a blowtorch. Hell yeah. Okay. And then right, The Exterminator 2. Guess who produced the second one? Mm-hmm. Canon Films. That's right. They were <laughs> just right. buying up vigilante movies. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I think this is like a tradition. That I was going to say, it seems to... like there's like a fascination with vigilante movies. I feel like there's a lot of that. I mean, it's an easy, easy concept for a movie it to is. execute. You just kill the main character's family and then you like, can just kill everyone yeah, indiscriminately. And that's all you gotta do. Yeah, he just can't take it anymore. Yep. It's something we've all understood at mm-hmm. one point or another. Yeah. Yeah. Easiest yeah. script to write ever. Yeah. The first one does kind of, well, I was going to say that that genre continued, I think, up until like at least the Brave one, right? The Jodie Foster oh, movie. I forgot is that about like that maybe movie. the most recent version of this? But I think. Wasn't there just. Wasn't there just oh, a vigil- death with the remake of Death yeah. Wish? Yeah. Well, yeah, but wasn't there just recently a vigilante kind of movie? Wasn't it the dude from uh, Better Call Saul? Nobody. Wasn't that kind no. of vigilante? I don't know. I didn't see it. It's he's. He's more like a, he, you know, he's got a certain special set of skills and somebody sets him off and then there's a Russian oh, mob that? and all this other stuff oh. that he gets involved in. I okay. feel like there's some really recent one where yeah, I feel we're like there's something... overlooking. I'm sure it'll come to me later. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably. Yeah. But it, didn't Eli Roth direct that new Death yeah. Wish? Yeah. <laughs> I like the new Death Wish. I, like, I know. But... I may actually would, you know, if somebody was to ask me, do you watch the Bronson one or the Eli Roth one? I may, but I got to rewatch it again. But I remember having maybe a better time with the Eli Roth. Is that just because Bruce Willis is like an actor versus Charles Bronson? Is that the difference? Like, 
Well, see, this is hard to say because it just seemed it was more, it moved uh, faster. Gotcha. You know, I mean, you know, one of those kind of things where it's like, oh, okay, everything's clicking. Where the first one, and maybe it was just my memory of it that it was mm-hmm. a, a slower movie. And then when I watched it again, I'm like, oh, it's actually, you know, I was paying more attention to the subtext where it's basically saying like, this is what these movies exploit is the idea that crime is rampant. Um, and we as a society have kind of entered into a contract with like the police are, are a protection. So we don't go out and take the law into our own hands and deal with like if somebody you know does something to you. Right. But if that contract is breached in some way, then, you know, this becomes like vigilantism. So it's like kind of wish fulfillment in some way, which I guess is where you get into like this kind of moral uh, shaky ground of like, are these movies mm-hmm. promoting uh, bad moral behavior. I mean, think about it. Anytime, like, there's like a true crime event or anything that happens in our society, or even there's memes like, you come for my kid, and like, all oh, bets yeah. are off, you know? Like, parents love to brag about what they do to people that hurt their kids. Mm-hmm. That's just like a weirdly gross American culture thing, you know? I think, well, I think that's everywhere, but it may be specifically an American thing because the first Death Wish does kind of t- tie it back to like an old West mentality, you know? The right. sheriffs, you know, like when somebody, something would happen in the town, it was up to the mm-hmm. You know, well, it, when we when we were watching this movie, I instantly thought of um, the Night Stalker when he's actually caught, and it's like yeah. the neighborhood catches him. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the whole neighborhood comes together. I was like, that's yeah. what's happening here. It's mm-hmm. the same thing. I was like, I get that. Oh, and this and in, in Death Wish Three. Yeah, that's what's different about yeah. Death Wish Three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Death Wish Three. Okay, I'm going to throw something else out there because I think if you were going to have a canon movie triple feature. Mm-hmm. It would be because I think these movies share the same worldview. Like, I think we could find uh, similarities between them. Okay. I think it's Invasion USA. Okay. Death Wish 3. Okay. And Cobra. Yeah. I was actually thinking, like, this feels like it's happening down the street from the Colt and Cobra. You know, yeah, yeah. it feels like this is a different gang's turf. That would rival the cult and Cobra, you know, but it the, felt like the same world. And the motivation of the killers is what in maybe all three. Well, I, I guess maybe Invasion USA, they have a different motivation, mm-hmm. but the motivation of the killers and Cobra is. It's just what they do. Yeah. They, yeah. 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 It's, it's just who they tough. are. Yeah. They're just like, we kill people. They're yeah. one dimensional, just right. evil fucking guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> we, you know. Well, there's even that part when like, is it the police chief is like reading off the statistics of like, there was this many rapes and this many, it, that sounds almost exactly like the opening monologue to Cobra mm-hmm. where he's reading the crime statistics. Mm-hmm. Oh you yeah. Know? Crime is a disease. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meet the cure. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someday right? people will appreciate that movie as much as we do, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> One day, It'll happen. As long as we keep on uh, mentioning, mm-hmm. bringing it up. I'm it, hey, I posted about this past holiday season. It is a Christmas movie. You should be watching Cobra <laughs> Christmas, not Die Hard. Watch Cobra. Uh, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. well, all three of the movies uh, have uh, the, the way that I remember them, right? At least Death Wish 3 and Invasion USA have this, where our hero goes either for a drive or a walk through a regular, quote unquote, regular American city uh, neighborhood and there's like a, just a display of every single kind of criminal behavior like just happening on the on the sidewalks mm-hmm. as he walks or drives by yeah. and i mean I, that kind of sort of happens in cobra we oh, see yeah. a montage mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah where the idea of the can so this is the canon worldview right this is where the monogam and golan is with these movies is that you can't even step five feet out your front door and you will see a massive amount of like, you are in danger. Uh, your mm-hmm. life is in danger. Yeah. <laughs> Just a hive of scum and villainy everywhere, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> I know it is. But that's what, like, this movie, does this take place in our reality? <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. It really does not. Because, like, we were, we've talked a lot about 80s street toughs on this show uh-huh. because they pop up so often, even in movies like, um, Oh fuck! What was that car racing movie with Charlie Sheen that I really like? Oh, um, the, the chase. The, no, no. What the wraith? The wraith. Oh. Yeah, like there was even cra- like crazy eighties street toughs yeah. in the wraith. Like they pop up in the most random of movies, but they're always the same. They have crazy chains and studs. They have yeah. crazy colored hair, crop tops, and mesh shirts, right. and bandanas, and suspenders, and chains. You name it. Yeah, like, and I I was a child in the eighties, but. I can't imagine that's what Street Toughs actually looked like. No, because like 
would you want to stand out that much? No. Like to that degree, you know what I'm saying? And in this movie, they've got the stripe painted down their head with the like hash marks on their forehead. It's v- which, like, to me, I was like, this is reject warriors. I'm like, this is this is yeah. a gang that couldn't make yeah. the cut in warriors. Very yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, because why would you want to identify yourself? You know, it's yeah. like, okay, so they've all got their own badge, basically. Right. You know, like- <laughs> That's like, that reminds me of my dad always used to go on this James Bond rant. He always used to talk about how <laughs> James Bond shouldn't look like a model because, like, you want to blend in and look like a normal person if you're a spy. So he was fucking stoked when Daniel Craig got hired. He was like, That's the guy. He was like, That guy looks more normal. He's like, Pierce Brosnan, he's too model looking. Like, this is my dad's stance for like 30 years about, like, I mean, James Bond wrong. should look like an average guy was his argument yeah 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 Yeah. (laughs) he should look more like charles bronson well he should i mean (laughs) if he wants to be a good spy yes he should well how do we cure this okay so uh, i guess when we're saying that there's um this mass uh crime wave uh sweeping you know whatever canon cannonburg cannonburg yeah cannonville uh what the cannonverse where does this movie take place like, I mean, specifically. It's supposed to be New, New York, York, right? It, yeah. I mean, it's not New York, but it's yeah. supposed to be New York. Yeah, they filmed a large percentage of it in London, but you I mean, can, can you describe the, uh, so I mean, basically, right, um, um, Kersey is invited to his friend Charlie's place. Mm-hmm. Charlie is killed by the gang, like in the beginning of the movie because he didn't pay protection money or something, but where... Where describe this neighborhood for me? Like, who are the people who live here? And like, because this becomes like a big deal. We're looking at a classic slum. This borough, it would have been. It's older people that have been there forever. That yep. at, at one point it was a nice place to live, and now it is overrun by street toughs and garbage, and it's crime ridden. Three feet of garbage everywhere. Yeah, yeah. it's like you're knee deep in garbage yeah. everywhere. But that, that I will say that is a very New York thing, not the garbage, but the well, the garbage. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the garbage. But um, the like the like eighty year old people that like moved into this building in their 20s and will die in this building that is a very new york thing like i mean i feel like that's a very like normal thing in most places you know Mm -hmm. like there are areas where we live that they're not the greatest areas anymore and there's Mm -hmm. elderly people living there because that's always where they live but a lot of times in new york it's because it's like rent controlled right and like that's like that episode of seinfeld where it's like where jerry's neighbor dies and they're trying to get the apartment you know because it's rent controlled like that is a very real thing that happens Mm -hmm. yeah they have um, this one has uh, Martin Balsam, um, who actually, sorry, uh, MF Mad has told us. Oh, here we go. That's right. We're I making, knew it. This movie's putting a bunch of people on the All Saturday right. Night Free Show. I wall saw a few faces when we were watching this. I'm like, he's going to be on the wall. <laughs> well, I suppose we should start. I'm going to give them to you as we talk about them. Okay. But we've already talked about the the one, the only. Here we go. The challenging the uh, you know, because Sylvester Stallone's oh. on there. So oh, no. Charles Bronson has finally made it to the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame wow. because he was in Death Wish 3, he was in 10 to Midnight, yeah. and he was also, when he was like, I think his first movie, House of Wax. Oh, wow. <laughs> he, was, wow. he was Igor in House of Wax. Oh, wow. Here we go. Uh, Martin Balsam, uh, he was in uh, Death Wish 3. He was also in The Delta Force. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And he was in The Sentinel, which we also oh, did yeah, on he was. the show. Yeah. Okay, so Martin Balsam is basically one of our uh, representative characters living in this uh, this place. Um, there's a lot. I thought that the I don't know if you guys saw this, but there's a lot kind of attention initially given to the idea that like these guys are war heroes. Yeah. Right. Like you know the, the yeah. feats that they did and all this stuff is like you know these are these guys who have these medals and they have all this shit that they saw and they went through and now they're like in their re- post retirement age and now they gotta fucking put up with these goddamn punks out front right. <laughs> throwing rocks through their windows running through their apartments in the middle of the night just coming in through the windows but like every day this is an everyday every occurrence of like some extreme uh, B and E, and then you know maybe assault or yeah. theft on top of it. Like every day, it's a felony. Yeah, you know, yeah. living in this <laughs> neighborhood, it's insane. When the gangs want to go shopping, they just go to the they go to hit the same apartment. Yeah, so. like they they treat it as though they're just like going to work. Like yeah. they're punching in the clock. All right, now they literally have a start people. time. Yeah, they literally like their leader tells them, "All right, go now," and they go on the clock. Yeah, like you've got, you've got yeah. twenty minutes to do drugs, and yeah. then we start work. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
<laughs> he it's, tells them that. Yes, yeah. I know. And like, there's three times as many gang members as there are people that live in this neighborhood. It yes. seems like, and that seems like that's where the problem is: is that they just have numbers because they're they do work like one organism though, because they all follow this guy. Who's the guy? What What was his name again? Fraker. Yeah, and he. he uh, Holly, you said he looks like Paul Bettany a little bit, yeah. a little bit like <laughs> like a like a dollar store version of yes, Paul Bettany. Yes, yeah. not as suave as Paul Bettany. And he has this haircut. And Colin, you said this is a reverse mullet. The reverse mohawk. Mohawk. Reverse, reverse mohawk. mohawk. Right. So because it's shaved down the middle, but like the sides are long and hang down. And I mean, if you want to look mentally unhinged, it's a good look, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. But mm-hmm. beyond that, I don't really know what it's. I good don't get for. it. Yeah, mm-hmm. don't get it. But you're saying they move as a hive mind. Yeah, like whatever he says, they all do. And like he can call them off at like a moment's notice if he wants to. It's like Mm -hmm. it is like a queen bee with bees. It's crazy. And then when we hit the end moment with him, they all disperse like and Mm -hmm. like it's like they regain consciousness and control of their own bodies almost like they get autonomy at the end of the movie. Without direction, we're nothing. We got to just retreat. I I like the, the fact in the movie, it's I mean. Uh, I was going to say hilarious. It's hilarious. He picks up a phone at some point no, and actually it is. calls in reinforce like, hey, it's me, Fraker. I need more. I need more heat in my neighborhood. Can you send more guys? And then the bikers show but up. It's a very, whole bike gang shows up. <laughs> but it's very like cordial. Yeah. He's very like, hey, it's me. <laughs> like, yeah, it's very cold, cordial. <laughs> it, it really felt like he was calling in a favor, but he was like nervous to call it. Yeah. In. Like he didn't know if they'd agree to it or not. Right. You know? Like, well, oh, I got to bug my boss on the weekend. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a there's a beef between him and Kersey because early on, because like for some. For no reason. For, well, yeah. Well, well, first of all, for no reason, because Kersey is in Charlie's apartment. Charlie's his friend that's dead. Mm-hmm. The cops bust in and like, you're here. So clearly you killed him and they take him to, the, to jail <laughs> and they throw him in jail. And there's where Fraker is. And. So at some point, Fraker's like, I want to hit that guy in the corner. And then they get into a fight. And because I think Bronson punches Fraker, Fraker's like, I'm going to get you. Well, first of all, not only am I going to get you, I'm going to kill an old lady you, you, just for you. <laughs> and you're going to see about it on the, on the oh, that news. Was so <laughs> random. Were we not? Didn't we just talk about last week? If you were a bad guy, would you explain your whole plan? And this yeah. guy explains his plan before he even does it. He hasn't even executed his plan yet. He's right. telling him yeah. what his plan's going to be. Yeah. This is a whole new level of bad guy, like, <laughs> revealing my plan. It's, it's terrible. Odd. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, this guy's, like, no one looks like this guy. There's no case of mistaken identity with Freaker, you know? Mm-hmm. No one else has a reverse mohawk and, like, is this tall, you know? Yeah. like And apparently goes around with this mark. I mean, right. like, they mark themselves, so you it's know, like how far... You know what I was thinking about? Like, the middle part that's shaved, it is, like, perfectly shaved. So, like, every day, he shaves that part of his mm-hmm. head. He like, has to. Yeah. He does that every day. I, th- I feel like he has someone in the gang do it for him. Yeah, I feel so. like he points at someone, he's like, you. Fix this. Well, maybe we should talk about some of the people who are in this gang. Mm-hmm. Who do we recognize? I don't remember. Who? <laughs> All right. Well, All I can think of is the giggler, but that's not who we're talking the, about. The giggler, because uh, <laughs> that actor, he Kirk looks ex- Taylor, looks like. He looks exactly like. Like Shabadoo like from Shabadoo. Breaking. Yeah. yeah. Another canon. Uh, <laughs> another exact- canon. Film. Like, we I- had to look it up and we still kind of didn't believe it. Yeah, because, like, it would make sense that it would be him because it's a canon yeah. movie. Yeah. So, right. like, just why like wouldn't him. they use it? Because you know? he looks like he's in the same costume yeah. as yes, Shabadoo. He does. Well, uh, Alex Winter. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Is one of, I think this is one of his, uh, maybe his first or, you know, uh, early roles. Yeah. But we're putting Alex Winter. And he was the one, as soon as he popped up on the screen, I was like, he's going to be on the wall. <laughs> I know it. What's he on the wall for? He was on, he was in Lost Boys. You are correct. And did we watch Bill and... Yes, we did. Okay. There you go. I was like, Brent probably picked it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bill, Bill from Bill and yeah, Ted yeah. is in this movie as a, uh, a gangster. Um, I also recognize Rico Ross. He was the quote unquote the Cuban who went and went off the the um, the, the the roof. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. He was uh, I think in Private Frost in Aliens, um, but he's not on the wall. Uh, the leader uh, Fraker is Gavin O'Hurlithy or O'Hurl- O'Hurlithy. Oh, oh, I should be able O'Hurley? to say that O'Hurlihy. O'Hurlihy. Um, his dad is famous. Daniel O'Hurlihy is the old man in RoboCop, and he was also in Halloween Three. But Gavin huh. is going on the wall. Tonight. What? Yeah. And you're like, well, yeah. What have yeah. you seen Gavin in? I don't know. He's pretty noticeable, so I'm kind of surprised no, I don't remember was... him. Oh, 
Oh, while we were watching this, I'm like, I know we've seen him. Yeah, because he's got one of them punchable faces. Yeah, he yeah. does. He does. Well, he was Eric Felbauer in a movie of clearly I'm not a fan of, but it's called Willow that we watched on oh, Saturday yeah. Night Freak Show. And he was also a guy with the punchable name of Brad. Apologies to all Brad. All Brad's out there. In Superman 3, oh, the Smallville wow. scenes <laughs> with Lana Lang. There you go. So anyway, he's your bad guy. Um, mm-hmm. So these, so how despicable are these bad guys? They beat up old people for no fucking reason all the time. Yeah. Like, I, I, I mean, I can't imagine living in a neighborhood where I'm getting home invaded every single day of my life. And then if I'm home while I'm getting home invaded, I'm going to get assaulted too, if not murdered, you yeah. know? And like, it, it, it seems relentless. It's like, yeah. you are right, Colin. They do treat it like this is their full-time job is to just b and e and assault people you know yeah because i'm not even sure if they're making money off of some of these assaults it doesn't seem like it like they're beating women in the street it seems like they rob them and if they have nothing to steal they rape them that's yeah. kind of it's, how it seems yeah. right or just both for the fun for the fun of it. and if you get away from them once then they're really pissed off and they're gonna come after you again yeah like yeah, yeah. There is a the there's a rape scene in this movie that I'm pointing out only because Marina Sirtis from Star Trek uh, mm-hmm. The Next Generation, um, Commander Deanna Troy mm-hmm. is the, in the movie. Um, that's part of a like an escalation, right? That happens to make you really just fucking hate these. Right. I mean, but is this like is this manipulation on the movie's part? Because it just kind of keeps on stepping up. I mean, it's like, well, when, okay, yeah. I am ready for somebody to just go to town yeah. and blow these fuckers when we were, away. When we were watching it, like the rape scene, I was getting to the point where I was like, okay, they're they're still going. Please don't show this. Like, mm-hmm. I do not want to see this because I didn't know how far they were going to take it. But then it became comic. <laughs> okay, yeah, the doctor Comically, really yes. killed the vibe of it be- this. It became. Oh, oh. The doctor took all the wind out of this fucking scene, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. And that's where it escalated to like, what the fuck are we watching? Yeah. That's where I was like, okay, that feels like a last minute rewrite almost. Like, I feel like she wasn't supposed right. to die. Right. They were just like, well, why don't we up the stakes some more? And she's dead now, <laughs> yeah. you know? Because the way the doctor comes in and delivers the, she has expired. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said she had a broken arm and like, she's dead now? Like, what was the point of that? Like, they could have cut that whole scene and just gave him the bad news on the phone. Yeah. Right, like, right. I think it that hits, was it. but it hits harder because the husband is like, oh, this is terrible, because he lives in the building. And, you know, I mean, they've been friendly with it because uh, uh, Kersey saves her from yeah. Alex Winter, I think, like, early on right, in the parking yeah. garage. So they're like, oh, you know, Mr. Kersey, thank you very much. And then, you know, he's like, oh, this is terrible. And... Paul's like, but your wife, you know, it's like she, you know, has a broken arm. Yeah. She's going to be fine. She's going to be fine. Okay. And then they get to the hospital. And apparently she had blood clots from a broken arm that went into her heart and killed her. Yeah. Which, But the way the doctor says this makes it sound like a lie. The way he says it, it <laughs> yeah. sounds like a lie. Is he in on it? Like, did the did they pay him? What's happening? Well, it was like, did they like break into the hospital and kill her to finish yeah. the job or something? Yeah. Like, that was my thought. She I, expired. I, if what? I was this person, if like. A doctor told me over the phone, she has a broken arm, she's going to be fine, you can come see her. And then I get to the hospital and I find out she's dead. I'm suing the fuck out of oh, them. Oh, hell yeah. Like, I'm hell taking yeah. them for all their work. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, they straight up lied over the phone. Like, yeah. Like, obviously the or broken arm was true. On the, on the ride, because it's New York, and God knows, oh, well, I don't know how close the nearest hospital is. I'm sure they have neighborhood. Oh, they have a I was going to say, yeah. they show him, they show, um, what's his name, watching the riots happen from his hospital room, so I think right. it's just like a block away. <laughs> but true. And like, they, it, okay, the broken arm stuff might have been true, but they said she was going to be fine. That's yeah. a straight up fucking lie. That's yeah. what I'd be suing them over. It's like, sure. you told me that there was no, like, real risk, right. and then I get to the hospital and you coldly tell me she passed. Like, yeah. But that's just the ridiculousness of this movie. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's canon, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's that. And then, you know, uh, the scene when he, like, invites himself over for dinner at the, uh, the old oh couple's place. God. Oh, yes. my God. Oh, my God. scene. Genius. I was standing outside, and I have smelled it. Whatever it was cooking is, it's delicious. Oh, that's probably the couple in the next apartment. Let's go over. And then the introduction is, hello, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. This is Paul Kersey. He was just admiring your dinner. <laughs> admiring your dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking love it. That is your in. Remember right that. There. Keep that in my back pocket. Yeah. 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 Why don't you come in and join us for dinner? Mm-hmm. 
And uh, while I think they're having dinner, mm-hmm. uh, there's a noise from outside because they're Kirstie, breaking into his car. Yeah. But what happens Bait. then? In the middle of dinner. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he, he gets up, he wipes his mouth, puts down his eyes. Excuse me. Walks outside, shoots the two hoodlums trying to steal his car and then comes back in. <laughs> And so help me God, they missed the best line they could have possibly used in this movie. Why, oh, why did he not say, what's for dessert? That's how you end that scene. Because he clearly was going back in for it, and it would have been a good through line with the ice cream later. Oh, it would have yeah. been like his thing is that he likes dessert. Yeah. Like, that's his thing. Yeah. Like, it was, man. How did, how did no one come up us. with that? How did no one come yeah. like, There wasn't, and like, a camera guy, that, or like a boom mic, like someone yeah. that was like, hey, you know what would be funny? How did no one come up with Cannon this? Cannon needs to hire us to punch up the scripts, you right? know? Like, yeah. Missed well, opportunity. The ice cream scene, uh, tell me about that. Well, before the ice cream scene, right, there's an escalation that takes place here because this is when Bronson appor- mail orders the will be. Right. Which we're told is not a 44 Magnum, but it's a will be Magnum that's apparently like air powered. And according to uh, some sources I looked up, every time this movie would air on TV, the sales of that gun would oh, go Oh, I'm up. sure. <laughs> I ch- yeah. No, because obviously I said this was my first experience with any Death Wish movie. So there is his uh, his his friend that his his wife expires. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a weird gun later on that it's like a pump like it looks like pipe a pipe thing. It, it looks, looks like, like a, a piece pipe. of pipe. It's like a pipe yeah. that he's pumping. And I tried to Google what it was, mm. and all I could come up with was the gun from Death Wish Three. Really? Because apparently, this gun that you're talking about is oh, seriously famous. I was gonna say, if you're just googling pipe gun, you're definitely on a watch list now. So, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. They're gonna it be serious. They're, they're gonna no be bored with me. It's anything. okay. You just pump the. It yeah. looks like a metal pipe, but yeah. it's a. It's it a almost shotgun. looks like a spyglass, like yeah. a, like a pirate spyglass that he's like pumping. I'm gonna have to explain this to my brother and see if he knows what it is. He yeah. he knows all about this shit, and I'm sure he's heard of the Death Wish Three Gun. If yeah. he's never well, seen wait, this, the I'm will sure be or the pipe gun. Well, I'm I'm sure he's heard of the death the the will be. I'm sure okay. he's heard of that, and I'm gonna ask him about it. But when I'm gonna I, ask him if he knows what that pipe thing is because I couldn't figure it out. Because I think when I googled it, right, even under the Wikipedia, like there was like the whatever forty something a uh, will be magnum. Oh yeah, and so I'm saying, like, it's oh wow, it's famous. Yeah, <laughs> some movies have their cars. Death Wish has its guns. It is a really cool looking gun though. Yes. Like it's it's like really sleek and modern looking. I like it. I like the way it looks. What happens in the ice cream scene? Uh, so now that he's got the Wilby, right? The yep, Wilby has. He's, he's in, got yeah. the Wilby, and he goes to walk to the local bo- bodega to get an ice cream. Yeah, he's determined to uh, have a confrontation with the giggler. Yep, and he has like a like an expensive camera on a strap just hanging over <laughs> his back. He goes and gets ice cream, gets one for the local kid too, mm-hmm. gives it to him. Nice. And Holly and I are like, he better have a fucking shootout with this ice cream in one hand and the gun <laughs> in the other. And we see him actually like unwrap this ice cream bar and start to eat it. And Holly and I are like, oh my god, it's gonna happen. <laughs> and then the giggler goes for his camera and shoves him into a fence really hard. He does not drop the ice cream no, he at doesn't. this moment, which Props that's a him. great move. Yeah. You know, got to save the ice cream. Yeah, uh, I get that move. Yeah. <laughs> but then he drops it to two hands. The will be, which and you was, have to. Yeah, yeah have to. <laughs> but I was hoping he would make it. I was hoping he'd take a bite of the ice cream and then shoot. You know, that I would have liked if yeah. he took a bite of it and then dropped it. Yeah, he really did need two hands. Yeah. I'll give him that. But he yeah, should have taken a bite first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he committed to that ice cream as long as he possibly could. And he I really, appreciate, I appreciate that, so. that. It looked mm-hmm. like a good ice cream bar. So mm-hmm. he blasts yeah. a hole in the giggler from like I don't know fifty mm-hmm. yards or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Why isn't he getting arrested for this? Do we? cover this already his deal with ed lauder oh right we didn't talk about this the police uh, chief yeah they wrongly arrest him at the beginning for because he's in the apartment when when charlie is dead so they think he did it so he goes to jail the chief of police is a fan of his <laughs> yeah. he's been following his vigilante work since day one and he wants to bring him on and like be a team a secret team a secret alliance if you will because you can do things yeah. that I can't. <laughs> yeah. You know, so he's encouraging this guy, go go out and do your stuff. Yeah. It's do, the, your, do your thing. It's <laughs> the canon version of Jim Gordon and Batman. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And you, you know what I'm here for. Us. You know, you yep. report to me and let me know. We'll get some collars or whatever. So, I mean, the Jimmy, the giggler, sorry, is uh, yeah. blasting in the street. What is the reaction to this? <laughs> <laughs> Because this is the movie is like lifting off. Like this is yeah. this movie keeps on going. Like 
Okay. <laughs> this is where we're going with this. The, 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 the chief shows up to the to the scene and he's surrounded by, there's like a circle of cops around this body laying on the ground. And he's like, and he like picks up and looks at the sheet and, you know, there's a brief like, oh, he's, he's known around the neighborhood. And then he's like, well, how have things been? And the other, the, one of the cops is like, they've been really great. Like he's just, <laughs> <laughs> This guy who is clearly not an actor. Holy yeah. shit, this line, yeah. this guy was not an actor. Uh, but I like the next day that the whole neighborhood's gossiping, like, did you hear the giggler got shot? The giggler's dead now. Like yeah. the whole that next clean, day. Like rob yeah. my purse. Yep. So, I mean, but, but that's the thing that this movie is, uh, which separates it from the, this is the movie where the actions of this one guy standing up against uh you know these criminals who have been uh you know basically uh, mm-hmm. uh, tormenting them day in and day out ha- is slowly like giving them this confidence <laughs> to rise like they're all like in awe and like you know this vigilanteism thing this vigilante is like a great guy it just, look it's the vigilante they don't call him the vigilante in this one it's <laughs> just occurred to me that this is the exact same plot of the three amigos like exactly. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> huh. I haven't seen that. Okay, don't. I mean, shoot I haven't me, seen but... it in a long time either. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. Right, I thought l- that was you, you hire like guys. To, that's the Magnificent Seven, right? You're hiring they, gunfighters, but you're actually getting actors, and then yeah, they invite them to. They think that they're actual gunfighters. They invite them to the town, and then at well, the end, the town comes together. It's exactly like the three. So this Amigos. is a western, is what we're saying. The, the Death of, Wish yeah. movies are, are are a western. This so feels like a western. Yeah, the town is Absolutely. rallying around the lone gunfighter who has come in and like is the first one to stand up against the. Uh, it's fucking Shane too, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, Shane. Okay. Like, the, the, like we've <laughs> we've seen the story many times. Yeah, <laughs> we've seen this story many times on the freak yeah. show. Even yeah. let, let the alone fuck, our outside movie. The Patrick career. Swayze movie we watched. Yeah. Oh Steel my Dawn. god. Steel Dawn. Yeah, yeah. we've Oof. seen this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. So okay. So as the as <laughs> all the, movies are just Shane, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That is like one of the great it is. stories. Colin, write that thesis <laughs> yeah. and have you know all the movie websites hire you for yeah. All movies are just Shane. Yeah, well, yeah. it's one. Of, it's gonna be one. What they say? There's like four stories. Yeah. It's gotta be one of the four stories. So all movies are Shane, <laughs> The Hidden Fortress, uh, and, that, and and there's two and, other uh, ones, I guess. And, yeah, and, listeners, yeah. what are the four movies? Yeah. <laughs> um. So. I guess is there's a point. Oh, 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 oh. So earlier I was saying that you know the movie's building up kind of your, your the way your anger toward mm-hmm. these. They're just they're subhuman. Yeah, they keep creatures, getting worse. Yeah, right. But what really puts the linchpin in it? We haven't even mentioned Deborah Raffin is in this movie. She was also in the Sentinel. She was one of the uh, other models, but she's she was, yeah. Um, the um public public defender. defender. Okay. Yeah. Who is drawn like a moth to flame. That's right. To the magnet. She is a thirsty motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> like, for reals. All right. So, I mean, you know, you're women. Charles Bronson. What, what do we got going on here? He's got grandpa energy. I'm sorry. It's not my thing. <laughs> I, I don't get it. Okay. I was just checking. I so, think her options are limited in her so seem neighborhood. To be, so. Seem to be, yeah. so we're saying it's the writing thing. Because she's immediately like... Well, uh, do you want to go get a drink, or you want to go to dinner? I think I feel like at my house. I feel in like my basement? you would have to, you know. I feel like you would have to ask, like my mom, if Charles Bronson yeah. was hot in the seventies. Yep. Like that's a more honest question. Yeah. Mm. You know, I think it's this. It's like a Tom Selleck effect. Like I look yeah. at Tom Selleck now, and I'm like, no, he's a grandfather. Like yep. no, but like my mom would look at Tom Selleck and be like, oh, Magnum <laughs> well, P. Magnum PI. But this, but well, you said he was 63 when he made this I movie. I believe so. So he was 63 in 84, 85. Yeah. So he wasn't exactly young <laughs> when the, you know back then. Yeah. Even, but, yeah. But that I'm means thinking, he was in yeah. his 50s throughout his his uh, 70s. Like, well, I'm right. thinking like 60s. I guess Charles Bronson. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking yeah. 60s when he's younger. Well, she can't get enough of him, and uh, they have a relationship where it's kind of you know this is where we find out that by relationship two dates. 
two dates, but consummated uh, in in her basement that's lit by uh, spotlights. Like stage spotlights. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> the, the, the local theater production lit this basement, apparently. This Jesus. Is, is this Charles Bronson? Is this like his opportunity to like, you know, because I guess it's the thing at the beginning of the movie. He's like, I put all that behind. Is that a pretty good Charles Bronson impression? Yeah, I mean, solid. yeah, okay. it's solid. Uh, you know, I don't do that killing anymore. I'm not that vigilante guy. Um, yeah, he already killed like, you know, 50 people, mm-hmm. <laughs> Los Angeles or whatever. Um, you know, so is this like his opportunity to uh, get back into humanity, right? A relationship here. This is what. No, because. Like it always ends in tragedy, well, and he yeah, should expect don't know that. that. That's the thing. Like this is his opportunity, but then fucking fate, you know. Just but if he's this also is the... a magnet for that, apparently. But if this is the third time this is happening to him, he sh- as a character should expect it. Yeah. He should be t- he should be telling this woman, "You can't get close to me because yeah. something bad will happen to you." He should be having that whole monologue with her. He's very, but he's very, he's very casual about it. Yeah, she's like, I, I get the feeling that like you're afraid to love again. And he's like, well, maybe. Like, yeah. He's, yeah. Just, he's just very like we'll see what happens <laughs> right exactly yeah but he's like you'll probably be dead by tomorrow but if you're not cool yeah uh Michaela, i've watched five of these movies and not mm-hmm. once is there ever that level of introspection where like really? you know, bad things happen to me no it's like each one of them seems to like restart even though they and they never <laughs> make reference back to events other than really the the first two movies but yeah, like okay, but he that's, cr- <laughs> that's he should, crazy. Because he should have mega PTSD, right? Like, well, and massive I, PTSD. I feel like every movie that's made now, whether it's warranted or not, there's that conversation of like, well, I just can't get close to anyone because mm-hmm. I yeah. lose everyone. Like whether that is in like relevant to the movie or not, that conversation always works its way into movies now. Yeah. So it's crazy that in five movies they never reach that point. No, he is he is exactly the same character in every so what you just saw here, he is that unchanging thing. So cause I'm never like I guess, you know, the five movie series, you're kind of like, well, what what does this guy think? What motivates him? Right. Is he, you know, just like, I love blowing people away. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you get that impression? No, I I feel like he's more of that like I don't want to say reluctant, but I think he's more like, this is my calling and whether yeah. I like it or not, this is what I'm put here to do. You I feel know? like it's just like you're having kind of like an off day at work and someone asks you to do something. You're like, well, it's my job. I got to yep. do it. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. the Punisher definitely comes from a place of like, Rage. this world is fucked and yeah. I, they took everything from me, yeah. so I'm going to take it all from them. Rage, yeah. vengeful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this is just like, meh. That's what I got to do. Unfortunately, know, yeah. this is what I'm good at. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and eventually they'll call on me mm-hmm. and, okay, I got to do it. And then, like, I'm able to help these people. But he never seems really enthusiastic no. about it. Well, because his heart is to design buildings, right? But that's never addressed in this movie. <laughs> although, this movie does put his design uh, skills to the test. Mm. We're going to have to come back to Deborah Raffin. Yeah. But tell he me. Al- he, <laughs> he home alone's the joint. <laughs> <laughs> these are some of the best scenes in the movie. <laughs> Where he figures out, because, you know, the criminals are always coming through the windows in these old folks, uh, you know, apartments. So he's going to rig up. Did these you think tracks. about this when we were watching Shoot Him Up last week? Yeah, because I knew I was picking this movie. Yeah. I knew I had already picked it. And I'm like, we're going to have some similar conversation uh, probably next week. But yeah, he rigs up. What is it, the first one? Like springboards when they come in through the window? No, no, it's the board with the nails sticking up. So that when they come through the window, they step on the yeah. nails. Oh, right, yeah. right, 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 right. Instead of the micro machine Hot Wheels. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> nails step on, on board. nails. Yeah. The second one is the what's it on the board? That's teeth. Yeah. It's the sideshow Bob stepping on a rake, basically a gag, but yeah, with a window, is. yeah, and a board. It was yeah. just missing a pie. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It felt like that's where it was going. It really did. Like, this is what stymies Fraker's attempts to, like, uh, you know, because now. Uh, Kersey is cutting in on his business and just this one man, we got to somehow figure out a way to take it. But out. like, what business? Like, what, where, the, well, what is the guy, business? The crime like, business, Michaela. But like, it doesn't seem like they're even crap. stealing stuff. Like, it yeah, seems the, like they don't even get that far, you know? Didn't they have like a table full of like all the stuff that they'd stolen at one point right. where he stabbed that guy in the neck or whatever? Yeah. Was second but for the amount of people that he has in his crew, it was not that much stuff. Like, yeah. and like, but I'm saying if he's booby trapping all these apartments to where they get in and they step on a nail, yeah, they're not coming not, home with much. This is not a graceful 
crime organization. No. This is not the mob. <laughs> it's not like, Sopranos you know, at no, all. No, no, no. No, no, no. no that's no. some top tier shit compared yeah. to this. Yeah. This is, yeah. Well, what is it? The uh, so so Deborah Raffin, right? Uh, th- that character. Sorry, the the public defender. This mm-hmm. is the the moment I think that sends Kersey into. We go into the uh, over the top third act, mm-hmm. which we're going to tell you about. But what, what what I'm going to say? What happens to her? What happens to her? I mean, I guess is it an over the top scene? Well, after their um, night of lovemaking, they are famished and have to go get food. But he's got to stop and get his mail first. So she's waiting for him in the car while he gets his mail, like you do on a date in the middle of the night, you know. And she is punched in the face by the mob boss. And then the car is, uh, the brake is hit and it, it the car is sent down a hill where it collides with another car and explodes. Like four times, to- three, at least twice. Right, right. But, Gigantic oh, but first, fireballs. But the car that it hits, it literally splits in half. And yep. then there's yep. like three explosions. Because yeah. this yeah. is a canon movie. And right, God right. damn it, if we're going to do explosions, <laughs> we're going to do explosions the canon and, way. And, and I love this shit because yes. they don't do this anymore. Now they're yes. like, no, no, if two cars hit, they're not going to explode. We don't want reality. Don't yeah. contain it. That's we, right. Do we, it the canon yes. way. <laughs> I feel like in the Fast and Furious movies, those, those cars never explode. They hit each other and then they just like bounce off and keep going is yeah. what it seems like. They never explode. Not like in, in the movies. canon days. Yeah. God damn it. I don't know what the hell fuel kind they right. were using. Right. Those things explode in giant fireballs in the middle of the street. Right. Joel and Silver then, would be proud. Yeah. Yes, he would. And then on uh, another indignity on top of that, it turns out Martin Balsam's uh, tire shop or whatever is bombed. Like the oh, very it was next taxi morning. meter repair shop, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it is? Taxi yeah, meter was, repair shop. It was. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe I'm okay with it being bombed. Then, if that's what hey, it is, that's his livelihood. <laughs> that's all he has. His wife is dead. He has nothing else. I know, man. Taking a taxi so unnecessarily expensive, though. Oh yes. my god. Well, a few they didn't have Uber back then. <laughs> can top, uh, you know, the 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 one in the Wraith, which might be the biggest explosion yeah. I've ever seen. But yeah. shit explodes in this goddamn movie oh, pretty yeah. good because his shop explodes. My shop, my shop, which he then tries to get revenge on by uh, raiding old Charlie's stash Mm -hmm. of World War II era weapons, including like this Browning submachine gun. But he's not Charles Bronson. He cannot wield this weapon. That's right. He's not worthy. The punks end up like throwing him over. He ends up in the hospital. Yeah. So then it's up to because now we have finally entered the level where this time it's personal. Right. Girlfriend is dead. Although I couldn't really read that on on uh, Bronson's face that he cared. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but I he's like, I now I gotta kill them all like cockroaches. I think he was more so, oh, fuck, that was my lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Maybe? <laughs> I think so. Or just like, man, like people are gonna really start looking at me with all these people that die around me. Right? That's more yeah. what it seems like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's gotta do something, and this triggers the last final 20 minutes of this movie, which we're gonna have to deal with probably, probably qu- pretty quick, which becomes all out Urban warfare. It's a war. It's a full on like yeah. war yes. happening in this New York neighborhood. Like, yeah. It is people on roofs shooting at people, people like machine guns, machine guns There's and it, any explosions. What? Like six or seven people get thrown off a roof. Yeah. Yeah. There's creeps in trees. Yep. Creeps in trees yeah. even. Yep. But at this point, the civilians are fighting back. Yes. Yeah. That is the That's key the key. thing. Yeah. So you've got like at least three different factions all going on here. You've got uh, the the gang. Yep. Right. Who are breaking into people's homes. Did we ever find out what the gang is called? No. No. They just have the weird like symbol yeah. on their forehead and the stripe. They never said what their name was. So yeah. I'm just see, curious. Yeah. See, at, le- at least all the gangs and the warriors had a name. You know? That's right. yeah. They knew what the names of them were. Not, not this right. one, we just identify them by that... Uh, is that like, uh, no, I was going to say, is that what Snake Eyes has on his? No, it's the last airbender song. I don't know. It's, it's like, it is not far off from the last airbender. Like, <laughs> hero, yeah. Yeah. Last airbender <laughs> totally stole it from uh, Death right. Um But yeah, the, the final 20 minutes of this movie are nuts to be anything else because you've got Charles Bronson assisted by, um, well, at least one of the. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Was there more people helping him, or just the one his buddy whose wife got killed? Yeah, he was uh, with the only the one helping. I mean, ever like I said, everyone gun. was fighting back at this point, but there was only one person helping him at this point. And, and like, then he switches over because the chief shows up. Yeah, the police right, yeah. show up, 
and they're on his side. And, and I did, I did appreciate like the enthusiasm on the police chief's face because I was like, he's been waiting for this for years. Yeah, he right. Didn't wait to fight with this guy. Yeah, like, right. I owe you that one, dude. He says, "Dude, a yeah. lot." There's like <laughs> what three or four stunt people that get set horribly on fire, including yes. a little old lady. Oh my, oh my god! god. It, like, like it did not look like you know when you can obviously see a fire suit. It did yeah. not look like an. There might have been a fire suit, but it wasn't obvious. No, is like, what I'm I saying. Could, it. I, I was, was looking, concerned. I, was like, I can see the jelly, but I can't see like protective gear. Right. Like, it yeah. was pretty intense. Right. This is what we love about this era's movies: is that people mm-hmm. look like they are in danger. There's one guy in a very oh, brief god. shot. Who, oh God! Yeah, I don't even know if anybody who's seen this movie will remember this moment. Why is you watching really it? Really quick. It's yeah. really quick. It's like a guy is standing in the street, and two I, I think, think police running. cars are. It was yeah. it when the cops were called yeah, in. Yeah, finally, it's when the cops are called in, and the like street toughs are like dispersing. Yes. because the cops are coming and in. And one of the street toughs is running down the street, and one of the stunt cars like. He has to like jump out of the way of the car. It was like, like right. two cars. Yeah, he was in between. He's two in cars. between two cars. Yeah. Like it was. It was a close call. And we have had too many moments in the freak show where we're watching a movie and we're like, oh, "Did we just see a stunt person die?" Yeah. Like that's happened far too many times. That's it was close. What makes my heart race yeah. right there. That's, a, that's action. <laughs> when it's like, oh like, Jesus! Like that was the death wish we found. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it ends up becoming Kersey, uh the the uh, the residents and the police captain yes. running through the alleys, blasting these guys away. But Fraker, the bad guy, eventually zeroes in. He survives the carnage, uh, and he ends yeah. up in Kersey. Kersey needs to go back to reload, and he follows him. Yeah, because I mean that's what once the Browning runs out, you know, do we say that he uses the uh, the machine gun, right? Oh, right, yeah, which is fucking awesome. All, yeah, because <laughs> he brought down. that back from the war, like you do, <laughs> and he has his friend hold the the ammo for him, the like, ammo the belt. belt. You yeah. got yeah. you got to have someone hold it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of ammo, damn it! And then he's got to go re- to the Wilby. Then the Wilby runs out of ammo yep. after he's unloaded. Uh, holy hell! On the, I mean, like buildings are exploding. Yes. Right. The the police uh, are involved. The the news media are involved. At some point, we're yeah. told thirty city blocks are on fire. <laughs> we yeah. see two buildings burn and collapse on film in this movie. At the end, like mm-hmm. that's why I was like, Colin, did they destroy like an actual town to make this? Because I wouldn't put it past canon to do that. Just yeah. be like, yeah. we can level this town. Sure. I'm yeah. not sure if that one was or not. I do know that they built the neighborhood in uh, in London somewhere but um in the end Fraker ends up uh getting a dead drop on uh a cursey in his apartment as he's reloading and we're like oh shit oh shit it's going down yeah but then he's saved by the police captain who shoots him yep and we we know that cursey also wears a bulletproof vest that's mm-hmm. why he's bulletproof and so the police captain or Kersey unloads on Fraker mm-hmm. and shoots him full of lead. And we're like, okay, the, you know. And I was so disappointed yeah. at this moment because I was like, You're really? Like, Seriously? Like he's going to go down with just like point blank, like six shooter. Like yeah. that's so lame compared to all the other shit we've Fear seen not, in this Michaela. movie. Fear not, Michaela. Fear not. <laughs> but I like that is not the death wish way. I liked that I fell for it though. I liked that I fell for it and then it was redeemed, you know? Yeah. Like how was it redeemed? <laughs> he craps a fucking bazooka and shoots him out the side of this building. And literally he is a pile of ash. Yeah. yeah. Rocket launcher. Yeah. Yes. Which he ordered in the mail. <laughs> Which I like he got the, I mean, can you do that? Right. I guess. I don't no, know. you can't do that. At one point I, he goes to his mail dead drop and gets like a package and brings it back. It's a rocket. It's a missile launcher. Colin, like, he probably ordered like each piece individually and then assembled it himself. He did because right? he got like two rockets. Yeah. Rocket. yeah. yeah. <laughs> or like that episode of The Office where Dwight's getting the secret Santa gift. It's and a potato. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he doesn't know what it is until he gets all the pieces. And yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this, uh, of course, because 1985 was the year that Invasion USA came out. I'm like, oh, Cannon was clearly mining the because a, yep. a rocket launcher plays mm-hmm. in there because it's great. <laughs> when, right. When you dispatch your bad guy with a rocket launcher at the end. Because the bad guy was also wearing the bulletproof, if just can- like yours. If Cannon did that in every single Cannon movie, I would never be disappointed. I know, right? I know. Yeah. It's like, you can't wear that out. If anything, get two of them and shoot them at the same <laughs> yeah. time. Let's Let's yeah. see that's what the, that happens when we do next that. One. Yeah, that's how you step it up. Uh, but, but I love that hit the street toughs gather around after this happens and look down at the pile of ash. Yeah, yeah. 
to, to confirm that that is him. Like, that's how us yeah. as the audience are supposed to know is that his followers are looking down at the pile of ash. Right. Yep. And then they're all just like, well. <laughs> then they all like, like I said, they gain their autonomy all, back. Yeah. It's like they're, it's like they've been unbrainwashed. It's like the end of Wonder Woman. Yeah. The war's over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they all just kind of retreat. <laughs> or, or like the end of Wonder Woman 2. Oh, where Jesus. the stone has been destroyed and no one's under the power of the stone anymore. Either way, it's Wonder Woman. Yeah. Yeah. It's very easy. To, and a lot of the punks, uh, I don't know, we didn't say this uh, also, but a lot of them are not armed with uh, guns. They have uh, pipes. Plungers. Axes. <laughs> lots of axes. <laughs> they use plungers. Yeah, no, seriously. So they have I was a, waiting to see the scene sword. where I was, was I was hoping he was going to put it in someone's mouth and just like pull it up and Plunge down a bunch and like I kind of like go waterboarding but like yeah. with just air or something that was the only thing I, I could think of for, I was like I want to suffocate see that come back into play yeah. yeah yeah there was lots of fire axes like yeah like yeah. fireman's axes yeah, yeah. yeah. boards and stuff mm-hmm. like that um, Pipes. but in the end with the threat now dispelled in the city back under control uh Kersey is turned loose because uh the police chief is like well, thanks for your help dude get out of here <laughs> yeah, and so Kersey picks up his bags and away he goes. Yeah. And he, he walks off to the funkiest soundtrack I've ever heard. Like, it, it it sounded like this could have been a TV show that came on like after TJ Hooker or something, yeah. right? Yeah, like, for sure. TJ Hooker followed by Death Wish, you Wait, know? we had this conversation off, Mic. Who did yeah. the music? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, we totally forgot to talk We need to talk about, about that. <laughs> um, what the fuck? <laughs> Jimmy Page did the music for this movie, and for the most part, Jimmy it's fucking excellent. Page. It's it's solid. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's some of the choices are a little weird, but I mean that's Jimmy Page. I, it's I very funky. No it's very funky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Page said, uh, "I guess he lived next door to Michael Winter." Jimmy Page is uh, from Led Zeppelin, right? And mm-hmm. I think they had already uh, John Bonham had, had died, and so they were yeah. kind of split up. Yeah, and uh, Michael Winter said, "You know, like, hey, I got this movie." Well, actually, he did the music for Death Wish Two. And right. he said it was experimental and he did it fairly quickly. And uh, then Michael Winter just used it again for Death Wish 3. So it's mm-hmm. the same music from Death Wish 2. But yeah, it's by uh, uh, Led Zeppelin's mm-hmm. Jimmy Page. The music Amazing. in the original one was uh, Herbie Hancock did the music. Nice. The really? That's Death awesome. Wish. Yeah. Um, Death Wish I, stepping it up. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just before we go. Um, so there were two more uh, movies in the series. Uh, okay. There was Death Wish for the crackdown where now you're like, well, everybody's dead. Who are we going to go after next? But uh, who needs justice? It turns out that there's a evil drug dealer who's, you know, because he's got you know, his new girlfriend's daughter ends up like, oh, uh, you know, sure. you know, falling you into found love again. And uh, that's directed by Jay Lee Thompson, who also directed 10 to Midnight. So all right, all right, now I'm more okay. interested. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and but that, but that movie, since that's the first one that Winter doesn't do, so it's less skeezy and exploitive and maybe a better movie, but also in some ways less interesting because gotcha. of that. And then there's Death Wish 5, The Face of Death. Oh. And um, I'm trying to remember which one um, Michael uh, Parks is in as the bad guy. Hmm. Might be that one, I think. But yeah, it's uh, there's a whole thing. So Paul Kersey keeps on going and probably kept, uh, could have kept on going after that. But unfortunately, that was interesting. Though, that there's like money after <laughs> that. There's like a Michael Winner trilogy. Mm-hmm. And then there's the, like, well, if you want to continue more. on before that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's interesting. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we've run long. That's yeah. uh, Death Wish 3 <laughs> yeah. uh, on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We're going to go around the room and tell you uh, what we thought of it individually and if we would recommend this movie because it sounds like we're uh, very uh, you know enthusiastic but you don't know until you actually hear this because this is where you know movies just go to get torn apart and uh, we find out what happened <laughs> but first we're going to answer some of your mail and to do that we're going to have to summon our mailman and his name is igor bring us the mail Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Do you think he has like a hidden bazooka anywhere? God, I, I hope so. I don't want to search for anything in his lair. <laughs> <laughs> there is no beanies happening there. No one wants to go in there. <laughs> Yeah, Igor is. A, uh, so, how uh, can people get a hold of us uh, so we can read their mail? 
They can, yeah, sorry, you can follow along <laughs> on, uh, on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook.com slash Sorry Freak Show. Uh, our Twitter. At Sad Freak Show. Uh, you can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. I'm all out of sorts tonight. I think the uh, problem is I made eye contact with you right before you saw that, Colin. I shouldn't do that. Well, about tonight's movie, Death Wish 3, Andrew Bradford writes in, he says, Death Wish 3 is an over-the-top but oh-so-fun to watch movie and perhaps the best in installment in the five-part franchise this was a mainstay on saturday afternoons in the mid-90s on local tv and i loved every minute of it a few things i learned from this movie running really fast makes for the ideal mugger rockets (laughs) for a rocket (laughs) that is uh, true giggler right (laughs) it may make a deal out of like how fast he can run uh rockets for a rocket launcher can be ordered through the mail (laughs) gang members gather to mourn when one of their own dies yeah (laughs) A 64-year-old man can fire a 30 caliber machine gun holding it in his bare hands so long as someone else holds the ammo belt. That's right. Yep. Cops will drive through an inner city battle firing their guns indiscriminately. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And a few city blocks filled with elderly residents can easily be mustered to defend their neighborhood with guns and booby traps. This is all true. Facts. All of it. (laughs) <laughs> uh, jerry fruhold says i was channel surfing with my grandma years ago i put this movie on i'll never forget how much she got into it get him bronson she said it was a fun ridiculous kind of problematic movie that i love i would be so proud of my grandma if she got into this i mean movie. if you're elderly and you're watching the elderly be like victimized i'm sure you'd be like hell yeah get him oh, bronson there's no know? way my grandma would watch this yeah <laughs> mine, mine wouldn't either it's not, Never. Hallmark. it's not on hallmark and john wayne's not in it she yep. has no interest well yeah he's uh yeah from john wayne to bronson um an american tradition to neeson <laughs> an englishman <laughs> irishman <laughs> Uh, Travis like okay, maybe I'm off on that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Travis Legler says, ah, the Death Wish films. The series seemed to get crazier as they went on, kind of like Fast and the Furious movies. I'm not sure if I saw this one. I know I've seen two and the remake a few years back. Question is, who really wanted this movie? Sean for the sequel love or Holly for the canon films love? Well, it turned out it was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and make no mistake. Our canon love is equal among all of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Ryan Handsome Jansen writes in, and he says, this movie is hilarious. Death by Bazooka. Mm. That was, I was so disappointed when he just got shot in the chest like Michael Myers. I was so happy yeah. that the bazooka came into play. <laughs> Always better with a bazooka. Always. And an explosion. He, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Joker 8522 says, how many Death Wish movies are there? Not including the Bruce Willis one. Well, that's uh, five. Five, five. Yeah. Five. Um, okay, so Karate Warrior Two says, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. okay, yeah. Says surely the cult phenomenon that is Robert Bronzy comes up for discussion here. Robert Bronzy. Okay, so if you don't know about this, this uh, surfaced a couple of years ago. Robert Bronzy is well, I guess he's an actor now, but this fucker looks. Like Ch- or like Charles Bronson. I think I have. Okay, I think I have heard about this. Then, like uncanny. Really, he looks like Charles Bronson, and so they've been putting him in a bunch of movies. He has like a career on the like way off the beaten track exploitation, you know, direct to video kind. Well, of Well, we're gonna have to do so. Well, at least we're gonna one have to do a little, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'll we'll tell you some of his one. titles. He was in Death Kiss. <laughs> He was in Once Upon a Time in Deadwood. Oh, Jesus. Oh, yikes. He was in Cry Havoc. And These he's are got, like asylum film yes, titles. Yeah, yikes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. But when you see this guy, you're like, oh, I'm my God. Google it's him, like yeah. Charles Bronson has so, been. You should, because he looks like Charles Bronson. I mean, Tarantino's <laughs> got to do something with him at some point, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> he's well, got I mean, It's just weird that you're making <laughs> movies. It's not about you. It's uh, you look like somebody else. So you got to pretend like you're Charles Bronson in the movies. Um, what was his name? Uh, Robert Bronzy. And uh, soon here we're going to have a photo and, and uh, Mikhail's going to show that. But in the meantime, last week we watched a movie called Shoot 'em Up. Uh, about Shoot 'em Up, Michael Whitaker said if you really want the modern incarnation of this movie, check out Boss Level. That's the one. I'm with, not uh, convinced this isn't Charles Bronson. Oh, we got a picture of uh, a yeah, side by side. Side by side of Robert Bronzy and Charles Shut- Bronson. This which one I'm sorry. <laughs> I I you know what? I actually I don't, don't know. know. I actually I, don't I can know. Tell you which one. Is it this is it the one on the That's right? That's Robert Bronson. Okay, the one on the right? Okay. And the other one's Charles Bronson. 
uncanny. I, I almost don't believe it. Yeah, I, gotta take <laughs> I your almost word think for this it. is I, like a deep fake. Yeah, no, he's, and this uh, guy isn't real. I don't think he speaks English very well. Oh, <laughs> so he's learning. Okay. Yeah, but like every picture of him looks exactly like Charles Bronson. Yeah, yeah, amazing, uncanny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's like Charles Bronson has been reborn. Wow. Wow. Uh, and he's out That's making insane. movies. Um, uh, sorry, which one was I re- reading? Uh, oh, uh, Boss Level. Boss Level was the movie with uh, Mel Gibson and Frank Grillo. Oh, that just came out. That sounds okay. familiar. Okay. I like Frank Grillo, so maybe. Yeah. Well, Michael Whitaker is recommending that he says if you're going to watch a Neville Dean Taylor movie, then it has to be Ghost Rider: Spirit of Vengeance. It's absolutely ridiculous and really good. In my opinion, I don't like Neville Dean Taylor movies, so I I'll pass on that. No, I, I, I'm I, not big on Ghost Rider either, so I saw Ghost Rider too, Michael. Mm-hmm. I, I think I'm going to have to disagree with yeah, you. Right yeah, yeah. Uh, Simon Carter says, "Where else would you find excessive violence, carrots, and a lactating hooker?" It's true. Yeah, that's it's got true. it all. Um, about uh, the previous week's movies, the movie The Others. Um, we were talking about the scene with the little girl and uh, I am your daughter. Yeah, that with the marionette from, and the veil. Yeah, mm-hmm. B-Shaw Foolery says that scene gave me nightmares. Yeah. I think it traumatized the whole generation. Yeah, that's pretty creepy, man. Well, we also asked uh, what were some of your uh, favorite haunted house movies. Urban Expression says Lady in White was a pretty good one. I haven't seen that. I don't know that one. Wait, really? Mm-mm. Really? I don't know that one. All right, you might want to check that one out. Okay. Um, 88, I think, but it's, yeah. Um, Jacob Laws says, I would say Poltergeist is the best one. Well, I mean, debatable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Here's the thing with Poltergeist. <laughs> no, one, no one dies. Yeah. No one dies in that movie. Yeah. But so the still, stakes are not that high. Well, you think they're going, they could die in any moment. But they don't. But it's like. Uh, spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> a spoiler. A spoiler like, for a movie that's 35 <laughs> years old. Like, yeah, we, it, nobody dies. But like the first time you watch it, you don't yeah. know that. And yeah. it is very effective. Yeah. I know. Because yeah. there's that fucking clown in that very goddamn effective. No, it has scary tree. moments. But like at the end, like, but like by the time you reach the conclusion, it's like, okay, well. Was it really that scary if no one died? You know, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. Like, I still think it's scary. Yeah, <laughs> only one guy dies in Twister. That was still scary. That's not a horror movie, though. <laughs> you think Wasn't Twi- it? You think Twister? No, scary? Yeah, Twister's a not a horror movie. movie. Nature horror movie. I'm scared of nature. It's no, that's Twister. like an action disaster. Well, movie. okay, man, maybe true. Sounds, like, horror sounds like we need to have a discussion. Is it yeah. Poltergeist rated like PG? It's PG. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, yeah. there was no PG 13 then. Right. And but. I just watched Grizzly where kids were getting their legs mm. chomped off, and that was PG. Mm-hmm. The PG was a brave <laughs> uh, brave rating yeah. back then. Uh, Richard Kratzer says uh, Poltergeist is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, the House and the Others is also reminiscent of Crimson Peak, set in Cumberland, England, the estate of Allerdale Hall, which is steadily sinking into the red clay mine. It sits atop while being eroded mm-hmm. by the weather. Yeah, uh, we, we mentioned that on our episode. Yeah, for like Crimson we talked Peak about that, talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Tony Bradshaw says the others was a thousand times better than the innkeepers. That movie was a huge disappointment. Isn't that a Ty West movie? It is. And Tony, hey, man, I'm gonna, his stuff I'm gonna, is really hit or miss. Yeah, isn't but it? I like that movie. I'm going to disagree with Tony. I haven't seen it in a while. I need to revisit it. Okay. Hmm. To have an opinion on it. Well, there you go. That's uh, yeah. I Thanks remember. everyone for writing in. Yeah. Yes, thank thank you. you very much. And now we're going to go around the room and tell you what we thought of death wish three, starting with, Michaela, what did you think of Death Wish 3? Well, uh, first of all, I, when I, I don't know a ton about Charles Bronson or the Death Wish movies. like, But so when I went to look at the IMDb for this, when Colin said he was going to pick it, I saw one thing and then immediately closed it because I saw all I needed to see. And it was the first line of the synopsis says architect slash vigilante. And I saw that and I said, okay, <laughs> I, I know exactly where we're at here. So I'm Sold. good. Close yep. The book. yep. <laughs> and I was like, between seeing that and knowing it's a canon film, I don't want to know anything else. Cause I want to go in and have a pure experience. And, um, I didn't really know what to expect because I know like I've seen the first death wish and that is a lot more of like a self serious film. I feel like, mm-hmm. um, and it's fine, but I think I would much rather watch this movie because it's crazier and more ridiculous. And that's what I want from a canon movie is crazy and ridiculous yes. and explosions and too many people falling off buildings and too many people on fire and uh, ridiculous big guns that come through the mail and stuff like that's all the stuff you want in a canon movie. And it doesn't really matter who your lead is or how 
present or charming they are in a canon movie that's not important i don't care about that like <laughs> and uh that's not why i'm here i'm not coming for the name above the title i'm coming mm-hmm. for like the people behind the scenes mm-hmm. um so i really enjoyed this and i enjoyed it a lot more than i thought i was going to when he went to get that fucking ice cream at yeah. first i was like yeah. i is going to get ice cream like a code for something and then when he actually got ice cream i was like oh my god he's gonna shoot people while he's holding ice cream holy <laughs> yeah. shit yeah so that was delightful i mean it's crazy it's ridiculous it's but it like it really goes for it It doesn't hold back ever and i always respect that and it has been a long time since we've watched a canon movie and i think we need to maybe start bringing more because Mm -hmm. like they always like overdo it instead of underdo it you know they they never play it safe or dial it back and that's what i love about them so i would definitely recommend it i think you should see it i think I mean, you don't need you don't need to have any previous death wish knowledge to see this. It really doesn't Sorry, matter. No, you guys didn't. Right, no, no, right. this is not like a mythology I'm familiar with, and I did just fine. So it's yeah. not like there's a trilogy story to follow or mm-hmm. anything. You can totally You'll just dive right into this one and enjoy it. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend it. Holly, what did you think? Um, you know, you were talking about what you expect from canon, and that they go over the top, and that's definitely what they do in this movie, and that's why we love canon. That's why it it just feels like freak show when we watch canon movies. Cause it is ridiculous. Like no matter what the content, there is something ridiculous about it. That's the personality of canon movies. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I've never seen death wish and I'm not sure I should watch any of the other ones because this one was, this was, this was what I needed from death wish. You know what I mean? Right. Um, the only, the only thing that I was disappointed with in this movie was the wanted horse poster. <laughs> oh, we forgot to talk about <laughs> we that. We didn't talk about the wanted horse poster. Several times at the beginning of this movie, in the police station, we see a horse wanted poster on the wall. And it's like a focal point of the shot. And we finally paused it and realized that they're just looking for new horses for the the officers. But it looks like an old-timey wanted poster. But it looks like a wanted poster. With and a it's portrait got a horse. of a horse, yeah. <laughs> and we desperately wanted there to be like a wanted horse in the city. And... When I found out there wasn't, that I was just really disappointed. That was the only thing I was disappointed with in this movie. The rest totally paid off. Everything about it. You know, at the end, I knew, I fucking knew he wasn't just going to die by a gun. I knew there was going to be something bigger. And when it was a bazooka, <laughs> the gods smiled upon us. I, It was so much fun. This, this was a good time. I'm going to say it. I would much rather watch a Charles Bronson movie than a Chuck Norris movie. I am. I, I, I am agree. Team yeah. Chuck I Norris. totally agree. I, I, I'm Team Charles Bronson. I have honestly never really understood the appeal of Chuck Norris. Yeah. Like I, 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 I still don't understand like the charisma of Charles Bronson. I don't. I don't get it at I all. I don't yeah. get it. <laughs> but but I'm there into is it. something so <laughs> likable about him, yeah. and I would much rather watch him in a movie, even though he's still kind of deadpan. Like I mean, he's got a smirk, so he's not like unexpressive, but. It's just kind of straight the whole time, but fuck it, it works. And the explosions and the shooting, it was just ridiculous. I I loved every second of it. So yeah, I definitely am going to recommend Death Wish 3. It was a good time. Good, Good job, Colin. I'm 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 frankly shocked. I, I thought, you know, first of all, you're saying like, yeah, we're gonna watch a Death Wish movie, and everybody goes groan, you know. And I was like, this isn't gonna play well, but I'm I'm surprised. Um, I think the Death Wish movies, I mean, they come with a certain amount of baggage. I guess there's something, you know, with that idea. Um, I suppose the the counter argument is always that they are encouraging um vigilanteism or something you know taking the law into your own hands like i mean if you look at it through those le- that lens i guess this movie as jerry said ha- is problematic but i'm like i think you could maybe level that well especially at the second one you know the first one i think is making like an actual you know social statement you know it's at least raising questions second one is exploitation you know kind of gross uh but this one doesn't take place in like our reality. I think that's how you can, you know, kind of like this is in the level of escapism and entertainment where everything is so heightened. Uh, you know, it's just so nuts. And then there was a point in the movie, I think where, when we were watching it, where I was asking you guys like, okay, at what point did this movie lose its fucking mind? Because it just goes like, you know, bonkers crazy for the end of it. 
Um, it's like it's it's unhinged the whole movie, but at one point you're like, "How the fuck did we get here?" Yeah, and then yeah. it's like this this movie almost you know, and then the the other two the 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 subsequent sequels are more restrained, and that's kind of disappointing. It's like okay, you're making a better movie, but it's less entertaining, colossally entertaining, like Death Wish Three, which is Death Wish Three is a canon movie. Oh yeah. You know, like it's, this yeah. is, this is what you think of when you think of the brand Canon. And I mm-hmm. seriously do think like, if you want to rig up a triple feature that will play great, it's invasion USA, death wish three and, and Cobra, uh, for the year, 1985, this was their mo- second most successful movie mm-hmm. behind invasion USA. So mm-hmm. there you go. The, 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 uh, the Chuck Norris curse, uh, continues <laughs> apparently yeah people like Chuck. i can't understand the appeal of either of these guys either really you know um and so i've been watching a lot of them because i don't get it mm-hmm. so i keep on you know but i think you're on to something holly with the idea that like um there is kind of an impression that uh charles bronson seems like he would be an okay dude in person mm-hmm. you know and, uh, you know, but he has this reputation as a tough guy. He just goes around punching people and, and shooting them. Uh, apparently he was not happy with these movies. Uh, Aww. he didn't like, you know, because I think there was a, you know, there was a massive criticism and a concern and, you know, he wasn't happy with the level of violence and all this other stuff that was going on. And so you kind of, even in this one, maybe feel that like, he's just kind of showing up, you know? Which I think kind of contributes to that. Like, what the hell did people see in this, you know, 60, what is it, 64, 63, whatever. He was in his 60s guy walking around, you know, I mean, he doesn't do a whole lot. And then he just blasts people away. But, like, somehow in the context of the canon universe, uh, this stuff works. And it works so well that you have to see Death Wish 3. I mean, definitely. If you, you haven't seen any of the other movies, you got to check this one out. The, the rest of them are going to disappoint you. <laughs> By comparison, I think this is a canon film. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you got to see it. So uh, that's a freak show approved uh, mm-hmm. movie experience. That's right. For Death Wish 3. Um, you got to check it out. So next week. We're going to watch a movie that's chosen by. We're going to conjure up the spirit of Sean real quick. <laughs> Sean, what are we watching next week? Oh, no. Well, I'm worried. Ironically, we were talking about this movie before I found out that we were watching it. It's Beastmaster. Oh, it's coming right. to uh, a Saturday right. Night Freak Show long it was, last. It was um, only a matter of time. Yeah. I'm Colin, surprised it took uh, Colin, did you conjure this? Because you mentioned maybe. it earlier. By yeah. mentioning yeah. it, yeah. like, somehow. <laughs> Sean heard you say it and was like, great idea, Colin. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, go, I'm like, is it because of the vinegar syndrome sale? Did you finally get, like, a copy? Oh, of that's exactly I, what I haven't checked is. to I see guarantee. what he answered. Yeah, that's but probably what happened. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay, so next week we're watching At Long Last, The Beastmaster on the Saturday Night Free Show. We, we hope you'll join us. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs>